This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello everyone, welcome to Living History and an episode that takes me out and about to explore an absolutely remarkable site. It's the Anzac Memorial in Hyde Park in Sydney. Now this building has stood here as an icon for veterans since 1934, but during the centenary years of the First World War, it underwent a major renovation. They built new water features and they built a wonderful new interpretive centre slash museum to really tell the story of Australians in war. And it's absolutely wonderful, the work that they've done there. So I was very excited to go through and check out this new museum, which only opened last year. And I was fortunate to be guided through the museum by the director, Brad Monera. And Brad's an old mate of mine. He's a wonderful historian. And the work he has done on this museum is absolutely extraordinary. They've done an incredible thing. Instead of trying to tell a chronological history of Australia's involvement in war, which is the way most museums would tackle the problem, they've gone a different way. They've decided to tell the story via individuals. So it's a museum that is a collection of individual stories relating to all facets of military service. It's it's quite unique and it's absolutely extraordinary. If you're in Sydney, I strongly recommend you get down there and check it out. And if you know me and if you've listened to these podcasts, I don't say that lightly because, to be honest, a lot of the new museums that I've seen, I don't rate at all. I, 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 I'm not a big fan of the way museums are trying to tell the story of military history these days. So when I see one that does it brilliantly, like the Anzac Memorial in Hyde Park does, I'm going to point it out and I'm going to tell you to go there because it's fantastic. So let's join Brad Monera as we tour the Anzac Memorial at Hyde Park. Brad, thanks for taking the time to show me through. I have not visited the memorial since all the work was done. Just give us a bit of an indication of what you wanted to do for the centenary and and how you accomplished it. Yeah, good on you, Matt. We've missed you. Um, The uh, situation was that the building opened in November of 1934 and uh, it was part of a... um, Um, a plan that I guess had evolved as a result of the casualties of Gallipoli. And so the people of New South Wales started to raise funds for a war memorial as early as 1916. And uh, then through the 1920s, uh, there was the issues about repatriating people got in the way, but there was a lot of demand for memorials. Uh, Archibald built the fountain at the top end of Hyde Park. Uh, Eventually the returned sailors and soldiers Imperial League built the Cenotaph in the heart of Sydney as a place of ceremony. But there was still this need to recognise the extraordinary grief that the people of New South Wales, uh, indeed around the world, were suffering as a result of the Great War. And they wanted a place of silent contemplation. Not a place of ceremony, that's all fixed got that sorted with the Cenotaph in Martin Place. They wanted a park setting. And so they ran a competition, ended up with an architect, Bruce Dellett, and he teamed up with an artist, uh, George Rayner Hoff. Hoff was a British migrant and uh, a veteran of the Great War, but he'd served as a map maker uh, based in Amiens uh, during the war. Dellett hadn't served, his older brother, Um, had served in the AIF and they designed a building and surrounds to be located in Hyde Park South so the garden already existed in the heart of that garden they built a rather monumental high deco building and the intention was to have a still water feature uh, flanked by poplars to the north I guess reminiscent of the watercourses of Europe, like the Somme. You know, everybody wrote about the lines of poplars that flanked watercourses, that flanked roads and so on. And so he he achieved that by 1934. He achieved the central building. What he wanted on the southern side was a cascade water feature using the topography, um, so a stepped waterfall, if you like, running down to Liverpool Street. But they ran out of money. And they had to open by November 34 because the Duke of Gloucester was coming out to open the shrine in Melbourne and uh, so a bit of interstate rivalry. They wanted to uh, get a, uh, a minor royal to open the, uh, uh, the Anzac Memorial as well. So 
um, that's what they did. Um, at the last minute, they had to raise a lot of cash, and uh, the women's auxiliary of the Returned Soldiers and Sailors Imperial League came up with the idea of um, selling little uh, gold plated stars and they they sold 120,000 of them and they're the stars that that um, sort of populate the the domed ceiling in the original building so the building was I don't know 80 percent 70 percent complete in time for the 1934 opening but there was always that cascade water feature that hadn't been completed and so it was a job half done with the centenary of the Great War, there was funding around um, for projects, and so New South Wales said we'd really like to finish that original, complete the the vision of the veterans of the 1914-18 war and put that cascade water feature in place. We had permission to put it in, dating back to the 1930s, so getting permission wasn't a problem, and now we had the money. And we thought, well, while we're digging up Hyde Park... Uh, to put in the cascade, let's go underground and create an education and interpretation centre because the building in the 1930s didn't need to be interpreted. The veterans and their families knew all about it. They were still suffering the grief. So the symbolism that is such a vital part of the original building was immediately uh, uh, comprehensible if that's a word, um, the passing, passing population knew exactly what it all meant. The problem we've got in the 21st century is that that symbolism has been lost to time. Young Australians aren't growing up with the stories of the First World War and the impact of that war on the Australian population. And so we set about using the centenary of, Federa- of, of the Great War money to create an interpretation centre for the original building. So what we've got is a space underneath the cascade feature that's a um, ceremonial space, a contemplative space that they're calling the Hall of Service, and that is lined with the names of over 1,700 uh, recruitment and um, uh, enlistment spaces, uh, locations, um, that... uh, soldiers from New South Wales put as their either where they enlisted from or uh, their place of association, where they grew up, the, the place that they thought of a, as home. And uh, that was the result of an extraordinary, you know, 20 plus years of work by Peter Dennis and uh, with some help by, um, by Jeff Gray down in, in Canberra. And they just turned all over that stuff to us. Here you go, free of charge. And uh, so we you know, fed that into the public service and they came up with a list of, as I say, over 1,700 locations and we got soil samples um, from those locations with the name of the place. So that, that populates the, the hall of service. In the floor, we made a ring uh, of uh, battle honours, if you like, or, or at least battle titles um, from the time that New South Wales became self-governing in the late 1850s through to 2018, because it's a centenary project. And so I chose 100 battlefields, consulted with military historians around the country, and uh, it, it got a little bit controversial. There were some fairly robust discussions, um, but we came up, we settled with uh, 100 uh, battlefields from the Maori Wars, the first formed units of soldiers from New South Wales to deploy overseas, were the 2nd and 4th Battalions of the Waikato uh, Militia. And so we we included Orakau and Taranga into the floor. Uh, And then, of course, the Sudan contingent from New South Wales in 1885. Um, Over half a dozen sites from the war in South Africa against the Boers. Um, We even included a a place for soil from Peking because the New South Wales Marine Light Infantry deployed to the Boxer Rebellion. The Chinese haven't allowed us to collect that soil yet. uh, It's still a little bit delicate, but one day in the future we'll be able to get some soil from the site of uh, where the, those New South Welshmen operated in aid of the civil power. And then, of course, a, a huge number of um, soil samples from the Great War, from Bitter Parker in uh, what's now New Britain, 
through to uh, um, um, soil from the beach at Cocos Keeling Islands, where where the Emden um, ran aground after after being um, destroyed in battle with HMAS Sydney, through to Gallipoli, uh, France, the Somme from 1916, Belgium in 1917, and and the Somme again in 1918. Uh, World War II sites from North Africa and uh, the, around the Mediterranean to the South Pacific. Um, we've tried to incorporate as much uh, naval and air content as we possibly can, and uh, so I was very privileged um, that some former colleagues from the Western Australian Maritime Museum who'd been involved in a study of the wreck of HMAS Sydney got us a little piece of the seabed right next to the forecastle of the wreck of HMAS Sydney. So we've got a little piece of the ocean floor from 2,650 metres under the Indian Ocean um, in the floor of the Anzac Memorial because there were 247 New South Welshmen on the, among the crew of HMAS Sydney when she was lost in November 1941. And uh, right through to the post-1945 conflicts, um, the Malayan Emergency, Confrontasi, with, uh, with Indonesia, the war in Vietnam, through to peacekeeping operations and, uh, and more recent conflicts in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. So 100 soil samples have really um, focused the, our visitors, gives them time to reflect before they walk into our historical gallery. And that uh, is, uh, leads off to, uh, off to the side of the Hall of Service. So, you know, it, it gives us an opportunity to um, talk about what the memorial does, and that is tell personal stories of soldiers, sailors, airmen, nurses, and more, and most particularly of the families of those that have served um, from colonial times through to the present day. And that's that's been our guiding. Uh, theme right from the start. There's no overall combat narrative. The Australian War Memorial in Canberra does that better than we could ever ever imagine. And so uh, what we've tried to do is make sure that that symbolism represents the lived experience of real people and, and particularly, obviously, real people from New South Wales. Um, each state in Australia created its own um, memorial. Uh, my home state in Western Australia, we turned our botanic gardens at Kings Park into our state memorial. The Victorians created a very classical shrine um, away from the CBD. Um, Sydney couldn't make up its mind so they ended up with a place of ceremony in the heart of the city at Martin Place and a location for silent contemplation and that's what we've got here at Hyde Park. But the symbolism was so rich for that generation it needs interpretation for the 21st century. And that's what we're trying to do here. Well, from what I've seen, it looks like you've done it really well. Um, on that subject of the, the evolving nature of memorials, what's the balance between the original vision when they first built the building we're sitting in and the requirements for a modern generation to understand what the hell went on a, a century ago? How do you get that right? How do you make sure that you're, you're maintaining what, uh, what was originally intended for the building? and that it's also speaking to the new generation. Is it even important to do that? I mean, what's your opinion about that? That's a frightening question. I don't know that there's an answer. It's one that we certainly asked ourselves during the process. Uh, we really weren't sure um, how to go about it. And the problem that we had with the original artist and the architect was that they both died in their 40s, so they didn't get old enough to become reflective. And so what they were trying to do, uh, they didn't write about. And so there's so many, this, this, the building invites so many questions. I'd really love to know what went on behind the scenes and who made those decisions. There are a few scraps of information, a few little pieces of correspondence that shows that uh, the artist and the architect corresponded with the official history team, uh, Charles Bean and his mob that were writing down at Tugranong. Uh, they corresponded with the army because the Royal Military College had moved to Sydney in 1932 uh, because of the Depression and um, Brigadier Francis Heritage was in charge up at Victoria Barracks and he was very critical. So there's these little glimpses into the fact that what they've done here was a contested space 
even back in the 1930s. So, you know, I, I thought, well, I've got to expect a little criticism with what we've done here. Uh, it's been marvellous just how positive the, the public have been, but there have been critics, and uh, so there should be. Um, you know, if, if 990,000 Australians wore a uniform during World War II, I think that means that there's close to a million war stories. There's, you know, everybody sees their service differently and the service of their family and friends. And so uh, the beauty of the original symbolism is that it can be read in a variety of ways. And so I hope we've tried to do that with the Interpretation Centre and invite people to make their own sense of it. What we tried to do was invite the visitors to think about the human form. Uh, when you look at the original building, the artist and the architect used the human form probably more than any other memorial in Australia, possibly the world. Um, you know, crowning the building are 16 buttress and four corner figures. Um, there are shallow reliefs on the in inside and outside of the building that have dozens and dozens of figures, all of them doing different military tasks. And so I think they were making a place where veterans could see themselves and they could tell people what they did in the war. And uh, so, you know, they tried to make a statement that could be interpreted in the widest possible uh, number of ways. Um, and it's also, you know, at the heart of the memorial is this extraordinary statue, Sacrifice, where using the story of the Spartan warrior being returned dead on his shield to those who loved him most, and the, the dead warrior is being supported by his mother, his wife and infant child, and his sister. And so the next of kin have got extraordinary prominence in this place. Um, so that's what we wanted to do with uh, the d historical displays, was take that idea of the lived experience of humans and run that through. Um, and so, you know, one of, the, one of the big criticisms we get is that there's no overall historical narrative, that what we're doing is just taking little glimpses of personal stories. We're living with that criticism because that's what I want people to take away from this. I think there are other, there are very fine museums uh, and the amount of information that's online can fill in those gaps. What we want people to take away from this place is that the war reached into every home in Australia. It affected the lives of real people. And uh, so that if we, if we achieve that, we've achieved our goal. Wonderful. Well, let's go and have a look. So, Brad, we're standing in, um, well, a very modern-looking museum space. We've got video monitors. We've got statuettes. Um, what's this room? Tell us about it. Well, this is the, the history gallery. It comes off that central uh, commemorative space, the Hall of Service, and uh, it's about 420 square metres. And the, uh, the plan was to take aspects of the original building and bring them down to floor level. Um, the, the buttress figures that crown the memorial are 30 metres off the ground. Uh, the, the shallow reliefs are uh, um, up to five, five and, and ten metres off the ground. And so it's very important for us to, uh, to, to bring those down to eye level and, to, um, and, and explain what they're doing. Um, when I was... Uh, a youngster back in the in the 60s, World War II was a constant presence. Um, I spent a lot of time as a kid with my grandparents and my grandfather had served in the RAAF during the war. Uh, on Saturday nights, him and his mates would sit around the piano and uh, sing wartime songs and, um, you know, after a few beers they'd speak in New Guinea pigeon and all that sort of stuff. You know, it was, World War Two was a constant presence. Uh, on top of the piano were photographs of his dad's generation who'd gone to the Great War. Um, so you didn't need to be ex to have commemoration explained. You grew up with it. 
Whereas I look now at my 11-year-old nephew and he's not growing up. I didn't serve. My brother hasn't served. Dad was the most reluctant national serviceman ever to wear a slouch hat in WA back in the 1950s. So it's been a few generations to, since somebody's taken a well-aimed shot at a member of our family. Um, so as a result, the, that, that knowledge has disappeared. Now we've got to teach the 21st century generation to commemorate before we can, you know, so they've got to be educated before they can commemorate. Um, things as basic as the division of a uh, branch of service or arm of service. And so we're walking into this long rectangular room that's divided by display cases and what we're seeing are each of the corner figures from the memorial reproduced in, by, uh, in, in resin models and brought down to ground level. And one is a, a naval lieutenant commander, one's an infantry lieutenant, uh, one's a lieutenant of Australian Flying Corps, and one is a junior matron. So an, a, um, a sailor, a soldier, an airman, and a nurse. These, this was the way uh, the veterans wanted to, to see themselves. They wanted to explain the way that the services worked. And so um, beyond each of these um, corner figures are the seated buttress figures. And there's 16 of those, most of them soldiers. So we've grouped them into these sort of little galleries, if you like, uh, telling their stories. So again, we've walked into a space. What we're seeing in front of us are um, openings that lead us into four small galleries. Uh, and each of those galleries is structured around a branch of service. The first gallery is the Navy. And so we've got the replica of the corner figure, the naval lieutenant commander, and uh, immediately opposite him is a large screen showing historic images of Australians going to war on the sea. And then in the centre is our infantry second lieutenant, a junior leader, uh, and next to him is a large screen showing Australians going to war on land. Uh, and then the final ones, obviously the, the aviator has a screen next to him that shows Australians going to war in the air, and the, and the nurse obviously looks at the um, medical treatment uh, of Australian soldiers from colonial times to the present day. So. That's all I wanted the introductory space to do, was to tell our visitors a, um, something as simple as some Australians go to war on the sea, some on land and some in the air. That's all we needed this space to do. And then you step through past those corner figures into each of the galleries. So let's wander down to the, uh, the, the, the first space, which is the, the naval space. We follow the British tradition, and so the Navy um, uh, come first. The Navy get, get priority. And Just something I wanted to touch on, Brad, which I think was really interesting, is you get a lot of young people coming in here. Obviously, a lot of this display is designed to, as you said, tell the story for people who didn't live through it. Do you think that, I understand there's a requirement for education for, for the newer generations, do you also think, think, though, this is part of the story of why they engage so strongly with this history? Because they didn't have to live through the alcoholic father coming home from the war. They didn't have to live through the trauma of what went on after these wars. Do you think that's part of the story, why young people engage so strongly with Anzac history? No, I think the significance of Anzac history is that it's such an important part of how we as Australians see ourselves. Uh, the, the Great War occurring um, just uh, so shortly after... Federation um, really made a um, big impact on the way we as Australians see ourselves, and so I think it's really uh, you know the the, the sort of uh, the Light Horseman or the uh, the Gallipoli Anzac or uh, um, you know similar uh, military figures became a really important part of how this emerging nation saw itself, and suddenly uh, we were called on to perform on a world stage and we didn't let the empire down. And so right from the start, uh, the, the sort of military history and the military prow prowess, if you like, of, of Australians has become part of our, our national self-image. And, uh, and, and I think you know, the, the 21st century generation is, is, is still growing up with that because you know, we, we, we do sort of tend to cast a large shadow 
um, probably punch above our weight, if you like, uh, on the world stage. And uh, so I think that's a, a big part of um, you know, the, the Australian story. Um, I think it's a bit of a shame that we're seeing the detail of Australian military history disappearing from school curriculum. And, uh, but, you know, that we, 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 we can but try. Well, you're doing a great job telling the story here, and we're, as you said, we're in the naval section. What's some of your, uh, what's what's some of the highlights of of this section of the gallery? Uh, they're they're all personal stories, and um, you know we've we've really got lucky in a number of cases. Um, you know we've got souvenirs of the Sydney Emden fight. Uh, there was uh, um, helping a, a friend in Western Australia edit the uh, history of the 44th Battalion, and um, the the final chapter. Uh, had never been published before. It was found in a, uh, a collection of, of old documents among a survivor of the battalion. And I remember the chapter heading said that the Germans fight for the fatherland, the French for the Republic, the British for the Empire, and the Australians for souvenirs. And uh, we really see that in the collection that evolved at this place. So it's based on personal souvenirs. So, you know, there's some great little bits and pieces that have come off the Emden. And, uh, you know, this, this, uh, um, uh, a shell case from Emden's main armament, a 10.5 centimetre uh, German naval gun, uh, but it's been beautifully engraved in China of dragons uh, because, of course, Emden's f uh, last port was Tsingtao in China. Uh, but next to it is a projectile from the secondary armament that was removed from Emden, and uh, this was being used as a doorstop in a backyard dunny on the central coast of New South Wales, and it wasn't until the uh, family member dropped it and the base broke away that they found a personal slip signed by Captain Glossop himself saying a, a souvenir taken from the wreck of the Emden. So uh, uh, fortunately the, um, the, uh, the object had been dropped and, uh, and, and this, this remarkable document from the, uh, the, the battle of November 1914 uh, emerged. And, uh, it may have gone for another few generations as a, a doorstop if, had, that, uh, had that not occurred. It makes you wonder what's out there in suburban households that we're yet to discover. Indeed. I mean, the um, uh, we got uh, extraordinarily lucky, I think, with this remarkable uh, medal group to a fellow named Bruce Harvey, who was the... Um, the Techno technician on board uh, HMAS Deloraine when the vessel was uh, uh, sank the I-124 off Darwin. You know this was the first major Japanese submarine incursion into Australian waters, and um, the I-124 was chasing an American convoy coming into Darwin. The Americans couldn't deal with it; they had to stay and protect the tanker, and so they called out the Australians. Only two or th two of the three Australian corvettes uh, was f were functional at that stage. Stage. And um, and uh, so Deloraine went out, the Australian small ship, the Corvette. Uh, its underwater detection equipment operator wasn't very well, so they grabbed one of the blokes from shore base Darwin, and that was uh, Bruce Johnson, uh, to to serve on that vessel. Um, and in a three-hour cat and mouse game, he detected the location of the I-124 and they repeatedly dropped death charges on that vessel and eventually sunk that Japanese submarine and she's still lying in 72 metres of water off Darwin Harbour, a gazetted Japanese war grave and uh, Johnson earned the Distinguished Service Cross um, um, ended up uh, having a heart attack on a uh, on a golf course in Western Australia in the in the 1970s. But his family have uh, because he was born and raised in Sydney. His family wanted to uh, donate his medals here, so we're we're very very fortunate to uh, to have his his medals on display. And uh, uh, I, I got to meet his his widow, and uh, she shared his, their wedding photograph. They got married during the war, and so with the uh, with the medals uh, is a photograph of the two of them on their wedding day with him looking resplendent in his uniform, but uh, she's looking rather magnificent in her, uh, her 1940s wedding dress. So uh, that 
um, story from the Second World War, the the Emden story from the Great War, running right through to material that we've got um, from uh, veterans of the uh, of the Gulf War who have donated their their material, and uh, because it's such a vital uh, role being played by Australian Defence Force personnel in the Persian Gulf to this day, and uh, so you know we've got the uh, the ensign from HMAS Melbourne. Uh, that was donated by one of our uh, one of our guides who was working here, and uh, she was uh, in charge of the sewing machine on board Melbourne. And uh, the flag was a uh, was a, getting a bit too tatty, so they took it down and it was put into her care and uh, eventually written off as they when they were returning to Australia. And uh, she donated it to us. She said, "Oh, you know, do you think I should have washed it?" And uh, I said, "Oh no, we really want to, because it's stained with the uh, the 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 dark red dust of the uh, of the Middle East." So rather pleased to have that on on display. I I like what you've done here, Brad. The significance played by more recent conflicts, because as much as we all appreciate and respect what went on in the First and Second World Wars in Vietnam, I mean, it is an evolving story, isn't it? It's it's continuing to this day we don't know what chapters are yet to be written in the Anzac story so I love the focus on on those more recent conflicts as well yeah look it's you know we were we got the funding to be a centenary statement and it would have been foolish of us I think to um, have just focused on the Great War Um, current serving personnel do see themselves as descendants of a tradition created by our First World War Anzacs. So I think it was essential that we uh, look at the buttress figures from the Great War and try and tell their story, but then also make it a 21st century story as well. In fact, I'll uh, show you what we've done with uh, the nurse's story because um, we were very lucky uh, in receiving a um, group of medals from the family when they were trying to do uh, one of their ancestors' graves up at Warrenura. Her name was Alice Cashin and uh, she was a, a, a matron served in Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service. Um, the Australian Army Nursing Service was um, uh, a very, very small unit during the Great War, and so many Australian nurses volunteered for uh, other units, particularly Queen Alexandra's. Alice Cashin was one of those, and uh, she earned two Royal Red Crosses during her service in the Great War, uh, and then returned to, to New South Wales, lived out the rest of her long life, and uh, she's she's buried in the uh, in the cemetery in the Shire. But uh, the family have donated her photograph album and uh, and her um, Royal Red Cross and bar and her trio of World War One service medals. And uh, fascinating because they're extremely rare to an Australian. The 1914 Star. Um, she was operating in an Australian uh, hospital at. Wimmeru in northern France in 1914, so a very rare medal to an Australian. Um, her, her, the bar to her Royal Red Cross is a marvellous story. She was uh, serving on a, a hospital ship that was torpedoed in the English Channel by a U-boat in 1917. The, the captain ordered abandoned ship. Uh, she said, my nurses and I are not leaving the vessel until our patients are all brought up on deck and and uh, evacuated. And uh, by the time they'd managed that, they realised the vessel wasn't sinking quite as quickly as uh, it had first been realised. And so they, with all of the pumps going and a great deal of luck, they made it back into a, a British port. And so the patients were saved and the ship was saved. So, uh, you know, an extraordinary uh, decoration for stubbornness basically and uh, great courage on the part of her and her nurses and their devotion to their their patients so uh, a great story from the first world war relating to our our matron figure and so I was thinking well how, what where do we start to look for a 21st century equivalent and while having those conversations the daughter of one of our guides uh, was who, who's a nurse at a hospital in Western Sydney, said that she was about to deploy to Afghanistan. And I said, 
Jennifer, next time you're in a really dodgy situation, would you box up your uniform and send it to us? And she did. And so at the end of that gallery, we've uh, got the uniform worn by a uh, Naval Reserve um, theatre nurse, uh, Jennifer Evans, uh, who served in the NATO hospital at Kandahar in 2014. So, you know, just, uh, you know, her devotion to her pa patients, her, her medical experience, uh, her, her experience of war is very, very similar to that of Alice Cashin, just a hundred years apart. Uh, of course, their tools have changed. Um, her patients were coming in by helicopter, uh, whereas Alice's obviously were we're arriving by, by train and hospital ship, um, but essentially that quality of devotion to patients hasn't hasn't changed. And uh, uh, but it's a it's a wonderful uniform because it's a disruptive pattern uniform, a camouflage uniform, if you will. Um, uh, of the latest pattern worn by the Australian Defence Force uh, personnel, but um, she wore a theatre scarf that is of white fabric with barcodes on it. Um, completely non-issue. Uh, and it came about because she was talking to her mother, who is also a theatre nurse, and, uh, and said that uh, she feels like they were being treated like numbers uh, on her deployment. Um, she was a, a naval reservist and she felt that working with soldiers you were being treated, the army treats its people like numbers. Uh, very much tongue in cheek, of course, but her mother discovered a bolt of cloth that was printed with barcodes and so she made theatre scarves for, for Jennifer and her entire team and you can see behind the uh, uniform is a photograph of Jennifer's team in the, in the hospital, in the surgical ward at, uh, at, of the NATO hospital at Kandahar, uh, all in their disruptive pattern uniforms but they've all got these barcoded theatre scarves on so it's a, uh, a lovely little personal touch to, uh, to the stories behind the uh, the objects in the memorial. It's wonderful to um, to see a museum that is dedicated to those personal stories. And I mean, you know, as, a, as, the, as the curator of this exhibition, you must have it must have been a, a wonderful experience to delve into all these stories. I can't imagine the ones that actually didn't make the cut, because you must have been inundated with amazing personal stories. Look, it's always been a privilege. Um, uh, Excite so many stories um, that really make you glad to be alive. Uh, some of them, though, very sad, very heartbreaking stories, but also some very humorous uh, stories as well. And, and so uh, but with this memorial created in the 1930s, it's the only memorial in Australia where they created little spaces where veterans could uh, have uh, breakout rooms f to create self-help groups. And so there was always um, a basic collection here, usually of material that veterans had left behind. And uh, some of their stories are remarkable. What we're standing in front of at the moment are uh, prosthetic limbs. And so the arm that we can see in front of us was issued by the Department of uh, Repatriation and Veterans Affairs uh, at the end of the Second World War to a soldier named Stan Mulliner. Now, Stan had... Uh, loved soldiering. He was a part-time soldier in the 1930s, couldn't wait to uh, join the AIF, but as a skilled instructor they'd kept him behind and he ended up teaching a militia unit. And um, when his unit finally got orders to deploy to uh, New Guinea in 1943, uh, he, he couldn't wait and uh, very, very keen. And tragically on their um, training exercise just prior to deploying, in an accident, a training accident, he got his right arm blown off. So he never served overseas. Um, so he stayed at the memorial as a member of the Limbless Soldiers Association. And uh, as prosthetic limbs got better, uh, he left the original limb that he'd been issued with um, here at the memorial. And so we've got it on display to tell that rather sad story, but a poignant story about a bloke who, who never served overseas 
but it always wanted to. Uh, next to it is a uh, a great yarn. The um, it's a it's a peg leg worn by a fellow named Jack Chidsey, who was tragically one of the the AIF soldiers, the Eighth Division, who became prisoners of war uh, in Changi uh, when Singapore fell in 1942. He'd lost his leg as a result of tropical ulcers and his mates in the prison camp uh, fashioned this from bits and pieces of aluminium from mould aeroplanes. So there's bits of metal brackets from a range of places. I think there's an old boot heel as the, as the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, foot of, the, of the, the piece, but it's hollowed out. And Chidzi used to smuggle rice from, uh, into the camp from uh, various supply dumps where his mates were working and uh, past the Japanese guard. Guards, you know, as you can imagine, a, a limbless soldier stumping into the camp, and the guards didn't bother to search him all that thoroughly. And the the, the hollow peg leg uh, was was used to, to smuggle contraband. And uh, of course, when he gets back to Australia, the government issues him with a, a much more professional piece of uh, um, gear to uh, you know a prosthetic leg. And so he left the uh, uh, the the peg that his mates had made for him in Changi here at the Anzac Memorial. And so we've got that on. On display with the uh, with the story and and the those those very very uh, challenging photographs of how skinny and emaciated the the survivors of the Japanese incarceration were and uh, that's extraordinary. Mm. Uh, I mean, another bloke was um, uh, um, you know, another set of medals that we had here were uh, the uh, the DSO. Uh, earned by uh, Colonel Clement Chapman, uh, who was a uh, surgeon, went away as a as a junior uh, surgeon with a uh, an Australian field ambulance. Uh, after Gallipoli, he realised that unless professional medical help was applied to wounded soldiers much closer to the front, they weren't going to survive. And uh, so, although he'd been recommended for a military cross on Gallipoli. That was cancelled and it was upgraded to a Distinguished Service Order on the Western Front uh, during the fighting in the Somme in 1916 because he put together a team of skilled surgeons and nurses, created a, an advanced dressing station that was very, very close behind the assault battalions at Poissier and the fighting further down the Somme and for that he was awarded a DSO. You know, how many soldiers did he save because he was able to apply immediate and highly skilled medical attention and as a result Australia and soldiers learned from that and uh, and uh, so you know our, our uh, the skill of our medics our combat medics uh, was second to none during the great war and uh, and the second world war and just next to that display we've got what i assume is a portable operating table and a whole selection of quite hideous looking medical implements what story does this tell <laughs> where, where do you start you know when you're looking at a, a bone saw in fact the the bone saw is a uh, a gift from the um uh, medical museum at um which is great it's one of one of sydney's unknown gems it's uh, at sydney hospital on macquarie street if you get a chance check out the uh, the museum there uh, it's uh, uh, it's in one of the oldest parts of the original hospital uh, but this particular bone saw was used by an australian uh, surgeon in the war in south africa um, 1899 to 1902 and uh, came back with him and was used by the family as a bread knife for a generation until they said no look, we think we'll <laughs> donate it to somewhere and uh, so a marvellous story but next to it is a surgical kit from 1917 that uh, was was owned by a doctor in Tasmania and uh, who, who donated it to us when, when he heard we were putting on a display that uh, tried to capture the experience of, of field surgeons and uh, it's got three trays full of weapon, uh, wound probes and forceps and bone sores and tourniquets and uh, you know extraordinary complete collection uh, that was, was in a home in Tasmania and uh, it's all sitting on a portable surgical table. The table was designed in 1908 and uh, is of the type used in Australian casualty clearing stations and, uh, and general hospitals right through the First World War. And like everything I'm looking at in this room, just in remarkable condition all of these specimens. I'm, uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm always amazed how much wonderful artefacts are left over from these important chapters of history. Indeed. I mean, it's just um, 
the stuff that people pinch and put aside and uh, or, or have been left behind somewhere uh, you know with uh, like with Chapman's medals they were they were left here the uh, um, Stan Mulliner's arm Jack Chidsey's leg uh, just left behind here at the memorial and uh, so we got got lucky uh, uh, that they just they've survived wonderful let's uh, let's continue the tour the uh, the the um, in session, if you like, as it talks about Australia's youngest service, the Royal Australian Air Force, uh, that evolved out of the Australian Flying Corps from the First World War. And so, you know, 2021, we'll be looking at the centenary of the, the Royal Australian Air Force. And, um, and, but uh, uh, the uh, the men of number three squadron told me that uh, when they were flying in Syria in 2016, uh, their their CO and uh, John Haley would constantly remind them that three squadron Australian Flying Corps was on active service as early as 1916, and uh, John Haley gave us his flying suit. It's standing there in the uh, in the corner of the. The, the room and uh, he's since been promoted and uh, he's a senior member of the RAAF staff in Canberra but um, they were a great bunch of characters uh, one of the uh, officers in the mess uh, gave me the squadron lucky watch now they call it the sand tiger um, they argued that it was potentially the ugliest G-Shock watch sold by any jeweller in Newcastle and uh, because it's on a, a mustard yellow and orange striped band and uh, so the, uh, the, the pilot who uh, acquired it prior to his tour in, in uh, the Middle East um, claimed that he talked the jeweller into a fairly substantial discount because the watch couldn't be sold because of its uh, colour scheme. But he thought that it looked like a desert, desert uh, disruptive pattern. So he bought this thing, christened it the Sand Tiger, and when they were flying out of uh, the UAE and on operations against Daesh in, uh, in Syria and, uh, and Iraq, they, um, uh, he felt that every time he wore that watch, he was called in to drop a bomb, and uh, that was what he'd trained for. That's what he uh, was was deployed for. So he was rather pleased. And, uh, and then he said, when they were coming to the end of their tour, uh, a friend of his who had flown a number of sorties but had never been called in to uh, to attack. Um, didn't have a watch and uh, so his mate loaned him the Sand Tiger and for the first time in his operational tour he got to drop a bomb so he was he was rather pleased and uh, and so the uh, the Sand Tiger entered squadron mythology so we're rather rather delighted that the uh, that the uh, flyers still believe in good luck omens and uh, and talisman and so we've got the three squadron Sand Tiger from their deployment to Syria uh, operations over the Middle East in 2016 and uh, that's in the sharing a case with the objects that um, uh, an Australian aviator uh, from 3 Squadron, uh, Nigel Love, um, brought back as souvenirs from his time over the Western Front in 1918 and they include the, uh, um, the section of his canvas uh, SE5 aircraft with its registration number on it that he got his pocket knife out and, and slashed away from the aircraft uh, as well as the, a similar souvenir of uh, red painted canvas that he took from the wreck of the Red Baron's plane uh, on the north bank of the Somme in 1918 and uh, alongside that is the, uh, the map of uh, Hamel and Villa Bretano, and that he mounted on a piece of uh, timber so that he could uh, make uh, markings of the or uh, note the enemy positions around Hamel uh, when he overflew the position in uh, in June uh, just prior to the attack on Hamel by uh, Monash's Australian Corps. So uh, so um, uh, Lieutenant Love was overflying and doing the scouting for the great battle of Hamel, and, and and we've got the map that sat on his knee in the open cockpit of his biplane when he did that so you know from from 19 uh, from 1918 in the great war um, through the the uniform worn by a uh, a mechanic uh, who flew as an air gunner with one squadron in the middle east in 1918 uh, through to uniforms worn by australian aviators in the second world war uh, the dfc in uniform worn by peter finley who uh, was mentioned in the official history um, 
for bringing back a crippled Halifax. The aircraft fell apart in the air, but he'd got his crew back to over Allied lines in 1944 and kept the aeroplane in the air long enough for them to bail out. And then he and his flight engineer got out at the last moment. Uh, It's described that pieces of the aircraft were falling around them as they floated to earth in their parachutes. So uh, the the battle dress uniform that he's wearing with his DFC uh, is on display. And at the other end of the display case is a um, a fighter pilot's service dress uh, to uh, a... uh, Sam Adcock, an Australian fighter pilot who flew with the Royal Air Force, number three squadron. And um, uh, and he's also mentioned in the official history uh, as the first Australian to shoot out, shoot down a, a doodlebug, a V1 flying bomb. And uh, an extraordinary uh, flying career. And uh, he was captured in the last weeks of the war um, flying a typhoon, launching rocket attacks on the German flying bomb sites in northern Europe. And uh, the family donated his medals, his flying log uh, and letters. And they tell a wonderful story about um, the, the love affair he was having with, a, with an English woman. And um, there's a terrific aerogram letter uh, from a German prisoner of war camp that had just been liberated by the... Uh, by the Americans, and he's writing uh, to uh, the woman that became his wife, saying, is, is the wedding still on? Um, but I, I might look a little different. I've been a bit burnt. And uh, the, uh, she, she must have got some warning of that because we've also got a letter in the collection in which uh, the squadron leader describes uh, to the family, uh, we're pretty sure that Sam got out safe. Uh, we could see him; he was on fire as he got out of the aircraft. But he, uh, but he pulled the ripcord on his parachute. So uh, again, just I, I keep saying the same thing, but extraordinary personal stories. Great personal stories, and you know what a wonderful, what a, a wonderful happy ending. There's a photograph of him uh, on his wedding day wearing the uniform that we've got on display with his bride standing next to him, but you can still kind of see the outline of his goggles because the rest of his face is still recovering from the burns that he suffered as he was getting out of his uh, his aircraft as it plummeted to earth. So, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're marvellous stories. The um, uh, At the end of the display, we, we had to make sure, of course, because of the buttress figures, that there are ground staff stories. You know, and, um, uh, always you know, the air force isn't just about uh, the the men in the in the air, but but there are those on the ground. And uh, we we had a a great collection donated to us by the the son of uh, Peter Omar, who was an instructor uh, in the RAAF uh, in training bases in Australia. And he was married with several children, and uh, he used to write to them during the war, and uh, he'd illustrate his letters with um, with little hand-drawn um depictions of uh, what they were going to do next time he had leave and there's a marvellous letter to uh, to his kids talking about going to the zoo next time he's in Sydney because he was operating, he was working at a training base on the outskirts of, of Sydney and uh, so he's drawn a little train, a little monkey and a little uh, little elephant in the in the letter so uh, uh, t- telling his, his kids that uh, next time he's, he's allowed leave he's going to take them to Taronga Park Zoo so they can have a look at the at the animals there, and uh, so yeah, it's uh, you know the, just the 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 humanity uh, of the wartime experience is a really important thing for us to to try and capture every bit as much as the the um, gas operated Vickers gun on display or the or the Viper uh, motor for um, that powered so many of the uh, First World War biplanes. Um, I think the, the the letters are even more precious. Than the uh, the machine gun and the and the engine. So what's this section, Brad? The the larger section of the uh, of the museum. Where are we standing now? Yeah, because it's it's the largest because most of the buttress figures related to the experience of Australian ground troops uh, during the First World War, um, initially on Gallipoli and then later in France and Belgium and and also in the Middle East. And so what we're looking at is a uh, a gallery. Uh, with display cases and between each display case are small clusters of uh, the 
recreations of the buttress figures, and they depict a wide variety of uh, military tasks, from our infantry soldier uh, to a mounted uh, gunner, because the guns in the First World War were horse-drawn, and um, a, a grenade thrower. Uh, then we've got a light horseman and a member of the Australian Light Car Patrol from the Middle East, a, um, an ammunition carrier from Gallipoli, uh, a field telephone signaller, uh, it was all rid at the, during the Great War, part of the uh, um, Australian uh, engineers, but um, now a, a, a separate corps, uh, a pioneer, and a uh, and a tunneler, and so you know all of this diversity gives us a an opportunity to show just how broad the experience of soldiering during the First World War and in subsequent wars uh, was. And so, you know, with our infantry soldier, for example, we've got artefacts, metal groups and, and, and uh, documents, images uh, and souvenirs from soldiers from the Sudan contingent, John Joseph Shying, whose who's, uh, great-great-great-grandson uh, lives in, in Orange, uh, in New South Wales, and when he heard about what we were doing, he donated his ancestors' uh, a pair of medals that he uh, was awarded for his service in the Sudan, and quite extraordinary because Shying's ancestors were Chinese, and uh, so he's, you know, he's this very, very Chinese-looking soldier uh, in a white pith helmet and red jacket and uh, and the medals that he he was uh, awarded for his service as an, a senior NCO with the New South, New South Wales Sudan contingent in 1885 through to uh, the, uh, the the medals that were sent to the mother of the youngest Australian soldier killed in action in the Great War Jack Harris lied about his age uh, and yet we've got the document from his dad and there's no mention of his age at all. It just says uh, that he permits his son to join the AIF. The kid was 15. He claimed that he was an 18-year-old clerk. The reality was he was a 15-year-old schoolboy, joined up from Cleveland Street School, landed at Gallipoli as a reinforcement to the 2nd Battalion. They got to the peninsula just before dawn on the 6th of August. Of course, as we know, 1st Brigade was sent into the charge at Lone Pine. That afternoon, he was dead by 7 o'clock that night. And um, so uh, initially listed as missing, the heartbreaking story that emerges from the collection is through the 40 documents that are telegrams, newspaper clippings and letters sent by his mum and dad to friends trying to work out was the boy missing or was he killed. And they've got friends in the UK that they're, they're writing to saying, look, can you go from hospital to hospital just to check whether he's, he's there and hasn't been identified? And uh, But eventually, uh, of course, the notification came through that they'd, they'd met somebody, uh, one of the wounded, who'd seen him die. And so we've got this letter from the Red Cross with a transcript of a description of a wounded soldier who lay beside him on the Turkish parapet at Lone Pine and said, I could, I could see how, how badly wounded he was and uh, clearly he wasn't going to survive. And so, you know, the mother kept that hope alive until that letter and a few personal effects arrived in the mail in February 1916, including uh, his identity disc and the draft of a Christmas card that he never obviously got to send her. Um, and, of course... Uh, she received his medals and his death plaque in the mail in the early 1920s and we're displaying them in the boxes that they arrived in the post. She never had them mounted, uh, she never threaded the ribbons and that's the way that we'll preserve them on display. Um, but then, you know, and there are other personal memorials, uh, one of which was the cricket ball that the great Australian fast bowler, the larrikin fast bowler Albert Cotter, known as Tibby to his family and friends, um, bowled um, f uh, six Englishmen for 40 runs or something like that. My father will abuse me and my father's a cricket tragic. I, I'm not. Um, but anyway, Cotter in the 1904 test uh, basically won it single-handed with his, his bowling record and uh, this was the cricket ball that he used. Um, he wasn't a great horseman but because of his, his uh, local fame uh, he joined the 12th Light Horse and uh, he, he went 
to Gallipoli. Of course, the 12th didn't deploy as a regiment. Uh, he was posted to First Light Horse and uh, a bit of a rat bag. Uh, he'd, uh, after the storms on the, uh, in November, uh, he was able to acquire a rum jar that had washed ashore and shared it with his mates and as a result suffered field punishment number two on the peninsula, but then rejoined 12th Light Horse and served with them through Sinai and was killed in the Great Charge at Beersheba. And uh, he, he rode in the charge as a stretcher bearer. And, uh, but his mum got that cricket ball and mounted a small silver plaque on the side in memory of Trooper Albert Cotter. And uh, so that's, that's in, the, in, the, uh, in the collection. Um, so, yeah, that, and, but then, you know, we've got this a steel postcard, if you like. Um, Warren Rolt from uh, Redfern RSL was a truck driver with the 6th Division, joined up in 1939, you know, he'd been unemployed during the Depression, and um, drove trucks right through the Middle East, uh, the Mediterranean campaigns, and then the the um, Pacific Islands. A very, very skilled sign writer by trade, and as you can see from the uh, the helmets that he wore, he's beautifully marked uh, them with all of the uh, locations in which he he served, and uh, as a as a member of the Army Service Corps attached to 16 Brigade, and uh, so they're they're really quite fascinating objects. He uh, obviously made one for himself and and one for his co-driver, and uh, they they cover all of the. The campaigns and all the countryside on which these these blokes drove, and it's just a, a fascinating uh, insight into uh, his attitude to the war. Clearly, you know, he born and raised in Redfern, never travelled outside Sydney, and suddenly. World War II gave him a chance to broaden his horizons and he got to see North Africa and the Mediterranean and, and the Pacific. It, 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 um, it, it, it took a world war to make him a citizen of the world. And uh, so it's a, you know, it's, they're, they're, they're a fascinating object and he clearly placed a great deal of value on them. And uh, when he passed away, his widow uh, donated them to the uh, local RSL and uh, they eventually passed them on to us. What about the the focal point of the room is this wonderful diorama um, depicting the, the the Australian soldiers slogging their way through the mud of Passchendaele. Tell us about the inspiration behind this and the story that it tells. Yeah, look, the um, uh, the, the 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 room is is quite beautiful. You know, the pol- polished jarra floors, uh, stone finishes on the walls. Everything is very clean and neat and beautifully presented. We had some very skilled uh, designers working with the curatorial team to create this space. Um, but I really wanted somehow to inject a feeling that th- that cleanliness is a hell of a long way from the battlefield um, and... That's how the veterans must have felt, having um, come back to Australia, come back to the peace and serenity and the, and the people who loved them most. Um, where did their heads go? How often did they um, uh, think about what they had lived through, what they'd seen, what they'd experienced? I remember a wonderful old neighbour of mine, John Norris, who was only a teenager when he enlisted in the Great War, and uh, we were sitting on his veranda one day and it came out of nowhere, but he just looked into the middle distance and said, God wasn't with us on the ridgeline at Passchendaele. And then got back to what else we'd been talking about. And, uh, and it just, I wish I could recreate the, the way he said that. But it, stay, it has stayed with me, obviously, for 40 plus years. And, um, and so uh, when I looked at the buttress figures here and clearly... They date from 1917. Our, our, our artillery uh, rider looks like he could have stepped out of a Septimus Power painting of bringing the guns up at, at, uh, uh, at Ypres. Our infantryman is rugged up with mud protectors around his, his leggings and so on. So it's clearly Ypres salient, 1917, the, the, the mud of, of, of Belgian Flanders. And uh, so, you know, I thought, right, we need to tell a story 
of the battles of Passchendaele. And clearly, if it's going to be about New South Wales, then the 34th Battalion's performance at Passchendaele, these are men that enlisted together from Maitland and the Hunter. And uh, so they're groups of mates that had grown up together. They enlist together. They serve, and tragically, before the German positions at Passchendaele, they die together. And yet they, they captured their allocated position. The battalions on either side weren't able to hold and so they made the deep penetration. They got to the outskirts of Passchendaele village but then had to fall back. And one of their great uh, company commanders was a 22-year-old kid from Wall's End named Clarence Jeffries and he was awarded a posthumous Victoria Cross. He was an only child. His loss devastated his family. His mother ended up leaving his Victoria Cross and medals on the altar in the cathedral at Newcastle, and they're still there. Um, So I wanted to tell Clarence Jeffrey's story about the the horrors of Passchendaele. So what we're looking at is a circular space about two and a half metres across, a patch of mud with a German blockhouse off to one side on the gently sloping ground moving up from the Australian attack line to the German positions on the Flanderen One trench complex and the German... um, concrete blockhouse and what we're looking at is a frozen moment. Charles Bean chose these picture plan models. Um, It's not a diorama because you can see it from 360 degrees so it's a a picture plan model um, of a frozen moment in time and so what our artist has recreated is about a 1 in 30 scale model of the mud of Passchendaele and a little glimpse a frozen moment of the survivors of B Company of the 34th Battalion at 8.30 in the morning of the 12th of October 1917 and they're attacking their third German blockhouse on that ridge line. Jeffries is killed shortly after this. Um, his senior non-commissioned officer drags the body out and buries it, um, marks the gas cape that he wraps him in with Jeffries' initials. Um, and uh, so... You know, and that, that, that breeds a much longer story because that senior NCO was the former underground manager on one of Jeffries' father's mines on the Hunter. Um, so this frozen moment shows a group of 18 Australian soldiers. The machine gunners have deployed on the right with Lewis guns to fire at the German blockhouse. An assault team is going in on the left to cut their way using wire cutters and grenades through the wire. Uh, and Jeffries is remaining in reserve with the rest of the platoon to consolidate. Uh, The Germans are trying to get a light machine gun out the back of the bunker uh, to provide a bit of defence in depth. So this is the critical moment of of this battle. They take that position but they can't hold because the uh, battalions on the flanks have been forced to to um, uh, fall back. And so uh, Jeffries is killed, but the senior NCO, James Bruce, eventually gathers the men up and leads them out of the place. But this is, this is the moment just before they win their, their little battle in the corner of what was a massive battlefield that extended across 13 kilometres of of devastated landscape, of mud-filled craters, of barbed wire, of rotting bodies and swept by machine gun and artillery fire and eventually poison gas. So it's, it's a depiction of a little corner of a foreign field uh, that, that killed and maimed so many Australians. Brad, it's uh, it's an incredible depiction. It's it's incredibly well done, as is everything that we've seen today. Thank you so much for taking the time to show me around. Anyone who's listening to this, do yourself a favour. When you are in Sydney, go to the Anzac Memorial in Hyde Park and visit this for yourself. We've told a small percentage of the thousands of amazing stories that are here. Brad, you're doing wonderful work. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, Matt, thank you very much indeed for your interest. And uh, yeah, I'd encourage anyone to take you up on the offer. Come and come and visit us. Thanks very much.